Hello, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are uh, we are streaming the day after the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police. Um, we also are gathered here in, comm in commemoration of Malcolm X, whose birthday um, was May 19th. Um, in addition to that, May 29th is the birthday of Minister Maurice Bishop who um, helped lead the successful Grenadian Revolution. And all of these dates are coalescing, coalescing around um, uh, the one year anniversary and lead us to explore very important um, elements of the movement today, the fight to end uh, police killings, as well as underscoring the long trajectory of fight for self-determination by, by Black people on this hemisphere, as well as the revolutionary undergirdings of the movement to um, free all uh, people within the diaspora and confronting um, uh, the United States government, both on, on, its ter on its turf within the United States, as well as abroad. Um, and as Malcolm, Malcolm X said, we are carrying his spirit um, with us today. And he said, that's not a chip on my shoulder, that's your foot on my neck. And he led demonstrations in Los Angeles, in New York, protesting police killings during his time and slain Grenadian Prime Minister Maurice Bishop led a revolution when the ruler, uh, uh, which led to the assassination um, of himself and then the overthrow of the revolution by uh, the United States, funded by the United States government. But for four years between 1979 and 1983, workers and farmers created their own self-determined socialist revolutionary government in Grenada. Um, and Grenada was free during those years of police brutality and free of the social ills that we are experiencing here um, in this country and that have been sparked by the, in part sparked by the murder of George Floyd, which culminated in over 27 million people across this country taking to the streets. So there are lessons, there are lessons that um, we are going to return to today from both um, Malcolm X and Maurice Bishop, as well as lessons um, that we are able to garner uh, of the movement and the freedom fighters who are um, leading the work today, both on the ground in Minneapolis, as well as across um, uh, the country and other cities. So I will, my name is Aislinn Pulley. I neglected to introduce myself. Um, and I am one of the co-executive directors of the Chicago Torture Justice Center, which was formed out of the 2015 reparations ordinance for survivors of Chicago police torture. Um, where in which a former police commander tortured at a very conservative estimate over 200 primarily black men and boys. Um, and, and that's just an estimate from one police officer. We know that that did not, torture did not end with that particular officer and has continued. Um, I'm also um, with BLM Chicago who recently split from the global network um, along with 10 other chapters in November. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce my co-chair, August Nims, who's professor of political science and African-American studies at the University of Minnesota. Thanks very much, um, Iceland. This is a real honor and a privilege to collaborate with uh, you once, once again, and especially with a uh, long time uh, friends and colleagues and comrades uh, on the panel, beginning with uh, Don Rojas, uh, Rosemary Mealy and uh, Mel Reeves, and hopefully, if he's able to join us, uh, Horace, uh, Horace Campbell. Uh, I wanna thank the uh, organizers for the, of the program for having this today. Uh, yesterday, yes, was the first anniversary, one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. Uh, just as important, if not more important, was the day after 
uh, the day after his murder today, one year ago, is when the masses took to the streets. Uh, the 5,000 uh, who gathered here in Minneapolis uh, about 5 p.m. Uh, to begin uh, marching uh, in the context of the pandemic. Uh, it was very liberating for all of us. We had no idea the significance of what we were doing. And uh, later on in the program, I'll say a few more words about the, uh, about the protests. So uh, without further ado, uh, I take it back to you, uh, Aisla. Thank you, August. So we are going to get started with our very first speaker, um, who is Don Rojas. And Don, I just want to um, invite you to turn on your camera. Um, he is the Director of Communications and International Relations Institute of the Black World, um, and was also a, a close comrade of, of um, Prime Minister Maurice Bishop. Thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you very much, Sister Pulley, and uh, thank you for that introduction, as well as uh, I want to thank the organizers of this uh, important forum for their invitation to participate. It's uh, for me an honor, indeed, uh, to uh, be in the company of uh, longtime friends and comrades uh, who have uh, had the pleasure of struggling alongside uh, over the over the many years, and uh, it's 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 just a delight to see that they are still uh, vibrant and uh, involved in uh, in the struggle for peace and social justice here in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, the topic of today's uh, 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 event is extremely critical and timely, and as you said, coming one year after the uh, the murder of uh, George Floyd, uh, it, this discussion uh, is, uh, is very apropos. Uh, I have been asked to, uh, to speak about the issue of police brutality uh, in Grenada, Grenada, the tiny island in, in the Caribbean that uh, made world history in 1979 uh, when uh, it overthrew a dictatorship uh, of a man by the name of Eric Gehry, uh, a ruthless autocrat uh, who had uh, misruled the Grenadian people uh, throughout the 1970s and was finally overthrown uh, in, a, um, in a people's uprising, in a rebellion, a popular rebellion, a popular revolution actually, that took place on March the 13th, 1979, and that brought to power uh, a, a revolutionary vanguard party known as the New Jewel Movement, and that was led by uh, the Prime Minister, who, uh, Brother Maurice Bishop, who went on to become the, uh, the revolutionary Prime Minister and leader of the Grenada Revolution. Uh, that happened in, uh, in 1979, and unfortunately, only four and a half years later, the revolution uh, was in fact overthrown. Uh, by a counter-revolutionary coup uh, that took place uh, inside of the ruling party uh, and government of Grenada uh, and uh, led to the uh, brutal assassination of uh, Maurice Bishop and a number of other members of uh, the Grenada government and members of the cabinet, uh, leaders of the New Jewel movement itself. Uh, and a few days later, after those tragic events took place, a few days later, the U.S. military, under um, under the command of uh, President Ronald Reagan, who was a president of the U.S. at that time, uh, invaded Grenada uh, in a uh, uh, in in a, a really brutal invasion uh, that uh, brought Grenada, uh, uh, brought, uh, basically. Uh, uh, killed the revolution after the revolution had imploded uh, the invasion made sure to uh, to put the last nail in the coffin of the revolution and uh, US imperialism at the time uh, claimed uh, the invasion to be a great victory uh, for uh, the forces of freedom in uh, in in the Americas <clears throat> I'm going to go into some 
too much detail on, on the four and a half years uh, of accomplishments uh, in, in Grenada during the period of the uh, revolutionary, uh, uh, people's revolutionary government, except to say that um, as it relates to uh, today's uh, topic, uh, the police brutality in Grenada uh, did not exist uh, during the time of the revolution, in the four and a half years. It was simply an honest issue. Uh, and, the, and the basic reason was that during that period of time, the revolution uh, established a people's revolutionary government, established a, uh, uh, a socialist state, and, um, and involved all of the people of the country in, in the process of, of uh, developing the, the, the island economically, socially, politically. They were involved in the democratic uh, process of developing uh, the country. But prior to uh, uh, the revolution coming into existence in 1979, during the period of the dictatorship, especially in the 1970s, uh, the Grenadian people has, uh, experienced a, a, a period of, uh, of police brutality that was, uh, by even by Caribbean standards, standards uh, truly deplorable. Um, a couple of uh, major incidents happened during uh, the 70s that helped to, uh, uh, to energize the revolutionary movement and the anti-dictatorship movement uh, in, the, in the latter part of that decade, leading eventually to the, uh, to the uh, overthrow of, of the dictatorship. Uh, what happened in 1973 uh, just to give you uh, an example of, uh, of police brutality in Grenada. Um, the dictator had, in fact, his own um, sort of uh, a version of the Tonton Makut in, uh, in Haiti under Duvalier. Uh, and th this uh, paramilitary goon squad was known as the Mongoose Gang. Uh, and they, uh, they answered only to the, to the dictator. They were uh, uh, and not uh, accountable to uh, uh, to any state uh, any state institution or any popular uh, institution. Not accountable uh, to the parliament of the country at the time. Accountable only to the to the dictator. And and, and under his command in 1973, uh, while a popular demonstration was taking place against the dictatorship led by Maurice Bishop and his father. His father's name was Rupert, Rupert Bishop. They were both leading a demonstration of thousands of people against uh, the dictatorship. And uh, uh, Bishop's father, Rupert, was shot dead in the back in 1973, in the back. Um, following that horrible event, a few years later, exactly three years later, uh, Maurice Bishop himself, uh, was uh, set upon by this uh, paramilitary uh, goon squad and was beaten almost to the point of death. Uh, uh, fortunately, he did survive and in fact went on to, um, to lead the New Deal movement in the revolution in 1979. Uh, during the four and a half years in power, uh, as I said, the revolution eliminated police brutality because the police force uh, was under the control and command of the revolutionary state. Kind of <laughs> sounds a little bit uh, foreign, I'm sure, to uh, uh, sisters and brothers here in the US, but it, 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 it has happened and it continues to happen in, in revolutionary Cuba, for example. The police force in Cuba is, uh, is under the control and command of the, uh, uh, of, uh, of the revolutionary state of Cuba. Uh, and so uh, no no violence or aggressive behavior towards the people uh, was permitted during the time of the, um, uh, of the Grenada Revolution, during that period of time. Also, it's notable that, uh, that, that crime uh, fell dramatically uh, during, the, uh, during, the revolutionary, during the revolutionary period. Uh, let me just uh, uh, draw a couple of uh, very interesting connections or similarities, you might say, or uh, between, uh, between Malcolm X, uh, who, whose birthday we celebrated a few days ago, and Maurice Bishop, whose birthday is coming up on the 29th of May. Um, a number of similarities uh, between the two of them. 
they were, of course, both uh, uh, fighters for the liberation of their people. They, that was something common to the two of them. Um, Malcolm X's writings and Malcolm X's speeches uh, had a profound influence on, uh, on the shaping of Maurice Bishop's political consciousness, uh, as well as uh, the consciousness of other leaders of the new, new Jewel movement. So there was that synergy there. Um, both uh, were born in May, as I said, uh, but um, uh, I'm sure a lot, most of our listeners or most of our viewers did not know that they also shared uh, the fact that uh, Malcolm X's mother, uh, her name was Louise Little, was actually born in Grenada. Malcolm's mother was born in Grenada, yes, in the year 1897, and she died in 19, 1989. Uh, like her husband, Earl Little, Malcolm's father, uh, Louise was a devout Garvey, uh, a follower of uh, the, uh, the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. And she worked for a number of years um, uh, for Garvey's uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association. Uh, a little bit of a, a history of a, of a remarkable woman uh, who, um, who has not been uh, given her, her due, uh, you know, to date anyway. Um, so uh, I will sum up by saying that um, uh, if, uh, if, Malcolm was, uh, if, if Malcolm and Maurice were alive today, uh, Malcolm would have been, what, 97 years old and Maurice would have been 70, 74, I believe. Um, I am sure that they would have been, they would have found a way to involve themselves uh, in the case of the U.S. in the, um, in the, in the building of a popular resistance movement to police brutality here in the United States. And, um, and, uh, and beyond that, to, uh, to contribute uh, to the uh, growing and expanding global uh, movement uh, for racial equity, for accountability, uh, the global anti-capitalist, anti-white supremacy movement that um, swept the world in the wake of, uh, in the wake of George Floyd's murder. Uh, I recall uh, uh, looking at uh, demonstrations last uh, spring and summer uh, broke, uh, that broke out in, in, in not only in hundreds of cities and towns in the United States, but in major cities in Europe. Uh, tens of thousands of people uh, took to the streets in London and Paris and, uh, and Rome. There were demonstrations uh, in, in, in places as far as Japan uh, and in uh, Australia and New Zealand where there has always been a, a, a strong resistance movement to white supremacy in those two countries by the native peoples of, uh, uh, of Australia, uh, the Aboriginal peoples, and by the native peoples of New Zealand, the Maori peoples. Uh, so they turned out in support and solidarity uh, with, um, with the demonstrations in, in New York. So what we witnessed for a short, all too brief period uh, was uh, manifestations of a global solidarity uh, for racial justice and for equity that uh, I have not uh, uh, experienced anything uh, in, my, in my many years uh, as, a, as an activist, uh, anything close to what we witnessed last year. So the question we, we have to pose to ourselves is what happens with all of that revolutionary energy one year after? Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, and I look forward to um, uh, to the opinions and the viewpoints of uh, of my fellow panelists uh, as we struggle with that and other questions, other pressing questions uh, that uh, that confront the movement uh, a year after the the death of uh, George Floyd. So I'll pause there. And uh, again, uh, greetings to all the sisters and brothers and comrades who have joined us this evening. Thank you so much. I learned, I learned so much and I'm really, really um, blown away by the fact that uh, Malcolm X's mother was Grenadian and was born in Grenada. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, I did not know that uh, Maurice Bishop's father and he organized together, led marches of thousands and then was, and then his father was killed by police. 
Right. Um, and then he himself was a recipient of, of police uh, violence. Um, and all of that is, is so poignant um, and, 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 and speaks exactly to um, the lineage that we're, we're in right now, the revolutionary lineage, the, the resistance that we're in right now. Um, um, and, and why um, talking about um, uh, the, the legacy and the work of Malcolm X and Maurice Bishop and the people of Grenada um, and the revolutionary um, uprisings that have happened um, against US capitalism and imperialism and colonialism um, and white supremacy are pressing issues right now. Um, and to that end, um, our next speaker is um, Mel Reeves, who uh, is um, on the ground in Minneapolis, has been leading many, many of these actions and demonstrations and marches of tens of thousands. Um, Mel has been uh, working directly with families, family after family member over the past, you know, 10 plus years. Um, um, and has been um, right there in the heat of the uh, in, in the heat and in the heart of the battle, um, and at the epicenter of the fight right now in this country, which has been uh, Minneapolis. And so, it's my honor to welcome Mel to um, uh, to to talk with us about um, what is going on in this moment and bringing the legacies of of um, the Grenadian Revolution. Maurice Bishop and Malcolm X um, into the present. Welcome, Mel, and please unmute yourself. Thanks, this season. That was a that was a that was a uh, that was a, a nice introduction. Um, yeah, I've been um, doing this for a while. In fact, as I was thinking about what I wanted to say, I was trying to figure out. You know, uh, there's, there's so many things to talk about, uh, but with such a distinguished panel, um, most of it would get covered. So what I thought I would do is break down a little history that August is probably very familiar with, um, gives you an idea of what, what I've been over, doing over years, uh, break down a little bit of history of police violence uh, in, in, in Minneapolis, as well as what happened around George Floyd here, and look at the, the political uh, ramifications and stuff, and just take apart some of the political uh, things that were brought up, uh, and also some of the work that I've been doing, as, as Aisla mentioned, around the family. So I want to hit on a few things so that I understand I have what, how many minutes do I have now? I know we had 10 initially, but somebody said I might have 15. What, what do I have now? Yeah, go, go, go in deep. You got 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Know. All right, because um, I, 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 I like the discussion part of these things myself. Um, but um, so uh, the history of police violence in Minneapolis, for, for me anyway, uh, starts with, um, it started way before the 90s. There was, there was problems that the Minneapolis Police Department has kind of been a wild department, like most other departments uh, in the country. Uh, the, but what, what makes it exceptional is that Minneapolis is known as a progressive and liberal haven. So you would think that the police would be kind of gentle police. Uh, the kind of police that the chief talked about in the stay, and we'll talk about that. In fact, uh, as I, one of the things I listed, uh, I think it was the last thing I listed, talks about uh, how the hypocrisy of the so-called kinder, gentler uh, um, police force that we know nothing about. Uh, so I started uh, my anti-police violence activism in 1990 when a kid named Tysell Nelson uh, was murdered. And uh, if you come here and you mention that name, anybody over 40, pretty much they know his name and, and, and that would be pretty young. But it's, it was, he's been a rallying cry for a long time because uh, uh, Lieutenant Dan May, who's on the force right now and actually trains people, murdered him, shot him in the back, running outside of a party uh, in the winter of 1990. And me and Chris Nissen, who's one of the, the, the best organizers I've ever met in my whole life, one of the most political, uh, clear people I've ever known, uh, who uh, is running some unfortunate stuff later in life. Uh, me and him pretty much uh, got with a few other folks, uh, Kim Washington and some other folks, and we said, hey, we got to organize and get some justice for this guy. Uh, now, this is the middle of winter in, in cold Minnesota. <laughs> Times have changed. We had no internet, no cell phone, and so you had to do things the hard way then. You had to make a flyer, and we had to go door to door. In fact, I think we even got Professor Nims to go door to door with this time to time. <laughs> Uh, those old days, remember? So we'd go door to door, 
passed out and we built we built the protest movement uh, and we fought to get justice for uh uh, Ty Sell Nelson, and, and we failed, but it energized people. It really did, and it woke folks up to this problem because people have been sleeping on it. And not that long after it, we uh, we protested the deaths of uh, uh, Smalley and Weiss. These are two older people who were burnt up in their homes as a result of a wrong house raid. And it was really gross. And the, the chief of police at the time really incited, helped us organize. He incited the, the, the city when he said they were victims and, and war and really really cold stuff because these people were in their late 70s early 80s and uh, they raided the house with flashbang burning an age and it caught the curtain on fire and the, the house caught on fire and the police didn't watch it watch these people burn um so we've had you know that that's kind of the history um police have been brutalizing folks it's been a long history of brutalization and 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 and, and killing and uh, starting in 1990 um more recently we had uh and it was 2000, ooh, the time is, I cannot, yeah, 2012, I think, or 13, Terrence Franklin was, was killed. Uh, and the police had come up with a wild scenario on how they killed him. Uh, and then not long after that, the next year, so you all heard Jer Jamar Clark, and he was killed literally a, a block from where I'm sitting now, literally right around the corner from where, where I'm sitting. Um, and um, he would, they were cleared again, uh, the Hennepin County. Uh, attorney who was uh, a um, Amy Klobuchar, who ran for uh, Senate, she actually uh, has a lot of blood on her hands. Um, she actually was, uh, I think she, no, she wasn't the prosecutor then, but Mike Freeman was the prosecutor. And the same thing keeps happening over and over again. Um, you know, they find a way to justify it. And we had, uh, of course, Philando Castillo. Now, the Philando Castillo case, we were to force the, uh, the same, the Ramsey County prosecutor to bring charges against his killer, Geronimo Yanez. And uh, he was set free. The, you know, the jury was, <laughs> the jury was a sad jury. Uh, they actually let people on jury who actually were friends of cops. And, and, and so never really had a chance. And, and the defense's cases, even though uh, Ms. Castile says, Valerie says that, you know, she was satisfied with, with their presentation. I kind of wasn't. I thought they could have done some things differently. So so those are the things that, you know, we've had these these cases of police violence. So there's nothing new. And we've been fighting and I've cut my teeth on fighting those those cases. Um, and so we come to uh, the, uh, the, the. Oh, so in the middle of those fights um, early on in the 90s uh, to kind of uh, appease us activists, um, the city offered. Well, we actually asked for the civilian review board. And this is important because we actually got a civilian review board, but we did not get subpoena power. But it had the ability to, to actually people would come and, and file complaints and that kind of thing. Civilians actually ran it. Uh, so over time, the police pushed back and the city pushed back and they took rest. They arrested control of the uh, review board from the civilians and then made it a police thing. And then eventually they got rid of the civilian review board, review board altogether. Uh, and uh, put it in the Civil Rights Department. Uh, Civil Rights Department was somewhat effective. They took it from them, and now they have the Office of Police. I always get an OCPR. I can't remember what that stands for, but it's Office of Police Accountability. And very little p police accountability goes on in that. Um, and um, so we built up quite, uh, um, um, I think, you know, here we've gotten really used to fighting uh, police brutality. I jokingly say when, you know, we see people come from outside, you know, like Al Sharpton and, the, and those other folks, it's like, this is not a small town where people don't fight police violence. You know, this we have a history. And when when uh, uh, Rodney King was beaten to an inch of his life, we had uh, the second or third largest uh, 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 sympathy protests uh, solidarity protest rather here in the Twin Cities. In fact, um, uh, August wrote about it. Um, me, uh, Keith Ellison, and Chris Nissen, and a few other folks, and, and, and August, and we led that protest. We had 7,000 people go to downtown. Now, I mentioned Keith Ellison because you all are familiar with him as Attorney General, right? You're familiar as, as, a, as a congressman. Well, believe it or not, Keith Ellison used to be a revolutionary. <laughs> He shared me and Chris's and August's ideas for the most part. And, you know, uh, we weren't all Marxists, but uh, he was stomped down revolution. He was right there with us, organizing, right? We were 
police violence, anti-police violence fights, anti-identification, housing fights. You remember August, right? He was right there with us. And, you know, he was talking about the need for revolution. He was stomped down revolutionary. But we knew something was kind of going to kilter with him because then he went from talking about being a revolutionary to joining the nation of Islam. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, he had his little moments with that, which when he decided to run for office, he had to try to bury those times, which was kind of fun to watch him squirm uh, if you knew about that history. Uh, but, uh, and so I bring him up because um, he, uh, you know, he knows our playbook on some level. You know, he went from doing that work and as a lawyer, he went to representing people. Then he ran the Legal Rights Center and folks whispered in his ear, hey, maybe you can run. So he became a local representative and then eventually became a national representative and now attorney general. Um, so he knows our playbook. So he said something real interesting. So forgive me if I get all over the place because I want to make sure I hit on some real important points. Uh, when uh, when uh, he had to take the case uh, and prosecute this case, he said aloud that it wasn't the protests that, that that caused him have to take this case, right? Now he said that because he knows the playbook. He knows that it's absolutely a fact. In fact, I remember at a protest, I took that on. I said, no, then nothing can be further than the truth. It was the protest that forced his hand, right? Because Mike Freeman had made his mind up he was going to take the case and do what he normally does, which is clear the police, which is what most, that's that's one of the things that got revealed in the uh, trial as well. That's what the prosecutor does. It was so hard to uh, uh, get police prosecuted because they take the side of the police. In fact, what they're usually doing is trying to clear the police. So yeah, Keith went, came, made a big statement. There's no scene in his press conference. He said, it was not the protest that brought him to this point. And it was exactly the protest that brought him to this point. And as y'all know, that George Floyd, uh, the protest followed George Floyd was historic because it happened all over the world. In fact, to this date, it's probably the largest protest in the history of protests. I may be wrong, but it's sure the largest protest against police violence, especially when you consider that, you know, every little enclave in the U.S., you know, it's like Podunk, Idaho had a protest, you know. Uh, and because I think what happened differently in the George Floyd thing was that everybody saw it, but I think we turned the corner. Everybody was able to see George Floyd's humanity. I think that that I think that's what move people. They saw George Floyd as a real human being, being and they identify with him, all right? Uh, so there's some real working class solidarity. Speaking of, uh, one of the things that I've been able to do, and, and, and Asian mentioned my work with families, is uh, several years back, well, you know, when we're doing the police violence case, as I was, you, you always wind up working with families, right? In fact, I, I figured, uh, it's not funny, but an interesting thing used to happen in the old days uh, when there was uh, a police violence case you know, even if somebody didn't die. Um, how do, well, I'm talking among friends, so we're going to tell the whole truth. So, you know, the opportunities spring up around this thing, unfortunately, right? Some people get involved because they have some other interests, and we've seen it with some groups now that have banked a whole lot of money. I'm sure maybe they're trying to do some good, but they banked a whole lot of money, and it hasn't gone to any families for the most part. And so you always have, oh, they do it, and, you know, there's all kinds of reasons some people come to these fights. And so I remember... Uh, me and Chris sometimes having to compete with the opportunists, like to get the family's attention. So it's like, you knew you had to go get the family because if the opportunists got the family, they were going to mislead them and, you know, water down the whole struggle. We saw that happen once and it happened one time to us. So that's not going to happen to us again. And we always got the family uh, and to talk to the family, told them who we, were, who we were and that, listen, what you got to do is fight for prosecution. And the family almost always listened to us and agreed and, you know, we would go in the same direction. And so as a result of doing all that work, I began to realize um, that we really had to put the families in the center of this movement. We can get all the activists and community members around, but the families represent the moral center of this thing, right? They, they you, you can't argue with the families. They've lost someone. You can't argue with somebody who's lost, you know, and I began to realize that the more we put the families out, it's more people began to see and understand just how real this is because these families suffer, you know, and when I say family and family, not just the mother or the father or the spouse, whatever, um, the whole family suffers when 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 they lose somebody from police fire. So uh, several years ago, when the police when the uh, Super Bowl was here, we did a conference called the Take a Knee Conference, where we brought families from um, all around the country. Uh, work with Aislinn uh, doing this, uh, Brock Satter in Boston, and uh, uh, Brian Taylor in Cincinnati, and some other folks from around the country. And we brought a group of folks, uh, you know, Dorothy from Chicago, and a few other folks from Chicago, Aislinn, um, and uh, they told their stories, and it was powerful, and it reinforced 
for me that we really got to put these families out front because when the families tell us, you can't argue with them. It, you know, when you see the families, you know that this issue of police violence is very real. So what we did following that uh, on the tale of, of George Floyd being murdered last July 6, uh, after we'd done a take knee conference, last July 6, we organized uh, a mother's march and conference and we brought in, we raised money and brought in families from all over the country. We had over a hundred some families here, pretty powerful stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, we got them together and uh, we raised three demands as we did before. That is that uh, the police be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, to jail the killer cops, uh, and that uh, we reopen all the cases. Uh, we, we, we've we been running that demand for a while. In fact, uh, you hear the group family supporting families here raising that demand all the time that, that the cases be reopened. We think there's a very r radical demand because it really puts the pressure on the system, you know, to re reopening the cases is a significant thing, but it's not unheard of because for those who remember uh, at the end of the freedom movement, uh, there was a demand to reopen the cases. And because the system felt so much pressure, a certain amount of pressure, they actually did reopen some of the cases. Uh, and some people say, well, they can't reopen all the cases. And that's true. Like in the case of Philando Castile, you know, that would cons be considered double jeopardy. But we could have the feds charge uh, Geronimo uh, uh, Yanez uh, look, and look at this case because he surely violated uh, Philando Castile's civil rights. I mean, that's, that's obvious that he did. Uh, so anyway, so those are our demands. And our third one was that we end the system of, of, of policing as we know it. Uh, instead of, you know, some of this, the defund the police and, you know, I'm not opposed to all that, but at the end of the day, this system, the problem is a system of policing. And I think uh, over the year in this fight uh, to get justice for George Floyd, I think we were able to really bring that to the fore. Uh, if you notice, we had a group here, Black Vision Collective, that advanced that idea, but if, if but they only had like one or two protests and the vast majority of protests raised the demand for prosecution. Right. And then lots of folks were talking about this as systemic, whereas, the, the, you know, the, you, there was a kind of a initially y'all saw on TV kind of a dog and pony show going on about the city council talked about disbanding the police. And all of you notice is kind of dissipated. Right. Because um, they really didn't mean they, 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 they their hearts just not in it. The mayor's heart's not in it. And so what we have now is that uh, nothing's really moved. Right. After all the smoke, nothing's really moved. And so. I think we were right, and one thing we always do is demand that the police be prosecuted. Because at the very least, you know, if we can hold them accountable on that level, you know, it, it, it at some point protects folks while we're making a demand, and it also puts more pressure on them. Though, while <laughs> the trial was going on, the New York Times recorded that about 62 people were killed by police. So there's still this pushback going on. But we think it's still important that you raise the demand of prosecution. Um, and so, um, that leads us to the trial in which uh, I thought what was interesting about the trial, we wrote a lot about it, which is that uh, what, what the trial revealed, I think, was that I thought it was a bit of a show trial because both sides tried to propagandize folks. If you notice, both sides made a big deal about saying that the police weren't on trial. You know, and they tried to make Derek Chauvin a sacrificial lamb for police violence in this country. <laughs> right. But just the opposite happened. I mean, I, I wrote a piece about um, I had everybody laughing when I said when the chief took the stand and talked about this kind and gentle and loving police force. And I, I made fun of him. I wrote a story going, you know, the chief describes a department unrecognizable to Minneapolis <laughs> because no, nobody knew anything about this kind of a gentler police force. Uh, you know, these guys. Just, and let me tell you something, too. In the midst of all this stuff going on, all this attention right on the police, the police were still brutalizing folks. There was an incident in North Minneapolis where they grabbed the wrong kid for carjacking. And, you know, you, you know, the tensions are heightened. Kids are like, we ain't taking this off, y'all. So, you know, folks are ready to go toe to toe. And so instead of the cops backing off, a bunch of young kids had surrounded the cops because they grabbed the wrong person. The kids were trying to tell them you got the wrong person. Their parents are coming. So there was John back and forth. And so the cops decided they had enough and they attacked this one kid, just like they've been doing. You know, they attacked him, you know, real cowardly, threw him on the ground. One big cop jumped on him and started punching him. And so, you know, we confronted the police chief. So what are you going to do about this? Right. So I think he kind of semi disciplined them. But the point is that it's something we got to discuss that, you know, this is still continuing. And I'd be interested to have a discussion about why people think, you know, the, the, you know that even though we push back on police violence, the police are still doing what they've always done. Uh, in fact, speaking of Malcolm X, 
uh, I've been interviewed a few times by these liberal reporters who want to put words in my mouth. And they say, well, uh, Mr. Reeves, hasn't there been progress? And I go, well, not quite. Uh, well, they've been, they passed this and they passed that. I go, yes, but not one single mis municipality in the U.S. has a mechanism to hold the police accountable if they hit somebody with that stick. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This, I don't think, I'm not aware of one municipality where they're saying that if a cop uh, uh, mistreats a citizen, we're going to send him home. And if he does it twice, we're going to fire him. Those, that, that's real accountability. And that, that doesn't happen. Malcolm X said, listen, you know, if the knife is in my back and you only pull it out six inches, you know, it's just, that's not just. So you pull it out three inches, it's still not just. If you pull it all the way out, it's still not just. He says, you know, that justice will be when you pull it out and you clean the wound. In our case, you know, uh, real, real progress would be if the police are actually being held accountable. And that's just not happening. It's not, they've talked a lot about it in Minneapolis. They talk so much about it that people start to believe that something really happened. <laughs> Nothing significant has happened. So I'm going to end with this. Uh, one of the things I thought was significant about the trial is, of course, you saw what happened around the trial. The city tried to do what I said, violence bait us and try to make us into the, the criminal when, you know, they, they, they try to flip the script. They'd actually been the criminal and try to make us, the victim, appear to be the criminal by putting up barbed wire fence and razor wire and all this craziness. Um, and, 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 I, and I called it out. Uh, but during the trial itself, I think it revealed, the trial revealed, while they were saying it wasn't about U.S. policing, it revealed the problem with U.S. police because Derek Chauvin had 26 complaints before he, he murdered George Floyd. You mean, you know, he, you couldn't call him in after 26 complaints that, you know, some kind of alarm wouldn't go off? Chauvin actually was a trainer. So it exposes that, no, rather than, than them actually uh, uh, wanting to discipline these guys, they're promoting these kind of folks. Uh, I think it also revealed that these holes, these choke holes, these knee and neck, that's part of police procedure. So while they were saying, oh, this isn't an indictment of police, they indicted themselves because the trial revealed that this is this is standard procedure. Also revealed that when people say they can't breathe, the cops are, are told to, are taught and trained to ignore that. They're saying, if you can breathe, <laughs> if you can talk, you can breathe. And of course, that's not medically true. And so several people have died, actually, who are saying they can't breathe because the cops have ignored it because they're actually trained that way. You know, some liberal folks always talk about, oh, the cops, you know, we just do something about the training. Well, this is where they would have a point. <laughs> if they stop training the cops to believe that somebody saying they can't breathe, uh, can breathe, that, that may save some lives. Also, I think they expose the role in medical examiners. In a lot of these cases, the medical examiners have lied, right? They've, they've, you know, they've changed, they've come up with conclusions that have supported the police and the ability for the police to get off. Also exposed this whole idea of uh, police killing people under the guise of excited delirium. So these is yeah. So this is another thing that came out uh, in the trial that this is a real thing. You know, people thought, oh, that can't be true. It can't be real. But excited delirium is something that the police are taught that people that people get to the point where they have inhuman strength. Mainly we're talking about black folks. And then the cops have to like really rev up to to deal with. Them. Anyway, so uh, rather than uh, so the trial, I think, actually did put the system of policing uh, on, on trial. So there's other things that I'd like to discuss around what happened here, like because um, somebody was asking me a lot about it. So we should discuss it at some point. Uh, I think it's interesting what's going on with Ben Crump and, and Al Sharpton. Um, and I think on some level they are, they, you know, they're a bit of a hindrance. But, you know, to Crump's credit, at least he does support the idea of activists fighting for justice or fighting for prosecution. Uh, in these cases. So, um, so I'm going to end with that. I just wanted to kind of do a recap of things I thought were, uh, were important. Um, and on his anniversary, again, I think that we have, um, we've made some progress. I think more and more people see this as seriously, as, as I mean, take this seriously, but, but bureaucratically and fundamentally, um, you know, there's been no, no real progress, uh, um, you know, in, in municipalities as far as saying, uh, we're going to hold police accountable. They, there's a lot of talk about it, but they literally have not hold, held police account, accountable. And so because of that, I said, nothing's really changed. Thank you so much, Mel. Um, there, you know, there, there's so much that I'm sitting with, particularly around the reminder that a year ago, um, th you know, there was a lot of hoopla and, and celebration over the announcement that 
Minneapolis was going to disband their police department. And people on the ground were saying, no, 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 this is a lie. This is a lie. This is a lie. Mm -hmm. And it was because they still exist. Um, and there's been no change, but it was a successful diversion away from an, an attempt to divert uh, uh, the, the masses of people who were out in the streets. Um, and so there really needs to be movement interrogation of that now, a reckoning. It's been a year that we can now actually point to empirically that that was a lie. Um, what, what people were saying on the ground was true and like, let's analyze that. Um, so that that is sticking out in my mind. And August, my co-chair also has some words that he's gonna um, share um, um, before um, I have the distinct honor of welcoming Dr. Rosemary Mealy. So August, please go ahead. And then we're gonna hear from um, uh, the great Dr. Rosemary Mealy. Thanks very much, uh, Aislinn. And uh, thanks again, uh, Mel, uh, to be on the same panel uh, with Mel Reeves. We were on a panel a few weeks ago, we actually did an in-person face-to-face panel on uh, why there are no George Floyds uh, in Cuba. Uh, so it's uh, fun to be with Mel again. We go way back. I thought, I think we began actually around Southern African anti-apartheid work is when uh, we, we met in the early 1980s. Uh, as Mel mentioned, he invited me to write something for his newspaper, uh, the Minneapolis Spokesman Recorder, and I'll just read my read my comments. None of us who had the privilege of participating in the first George Floyd protests the day after his murder could have imagined what it heralded both politically and globally. Global is something I didn't get a chance to elaborate on in my piece of importance, uh, not only in the countries that Don and Mel mentioned, also Nigeria. Also in Nigeria, it's very important to think about uh, uh, the George Floyd movement in Nigeria. What it revealed was that it wasn't just about race, it was about the, about the police, the police acting as the police. This is why thousands of Nigerians took to the streets and identified uh, with the George Floyd uh, protests, okay. We were simply doing what had to be done to express our outrage at the latest barbarity of the police, also unmistakably visible. Never to be forgotten was the context, the pandemic lockdown. They gave Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry license to intimate that we couldn't gather unless mask and quote unquote socially distance. But the mayor's police with blood on their hands were not to be seen. In hindsight, the May 26 protests done in outrageous sorrow was Liberation Day for the pandemic lockdown masses, not only in Minnesota, but far beyond. Also of significance, the multiracial character of the May 26 protests. More than half of the participants were white or Caucasians, not to be taken for granted. For those of us who witnessed anti-police brutality protests in the 1960s, we know better anti-police brutality actions in most of the United States as late as the 1990s were almost exclusively an African-American affair. To be white in the vicinity of such protests could in fact be life-threatening. Like many, I often replied and explained the mass outpourings, not just in cities, but the suburbs and the small towns, that the heinous crime was captured on film, a rarity. But I began to realize that that explanation was inadequate. Uh, only at best half of the story. Exactly a century earlier, exactly a century earlier, three black men were brutally lynched in Duluth, Minnesota. No, not Duluth, Georgia, Duluth, Minnesota, captured on camera and celebrated. Many of the 10,000 celebrants wanted, in fact, to be photographed in gleefully cruel juxtaposition to the bodies of the three victims. It can all be Googled for verification. In other words, what may be outrageous in one moment may be celebrated in another. Why? Because attitudes can change, even deep-seated ones around race. The mass movements of Black people and our allies in the streets beginning less than halfway between 1920 in 2020, it goes a long way in explaining those profound changes. The multiracial, multi-gendered jury that 
convicted Derek Chauvin, a white cop, of second degree murder for killing a black man. In other words, four white women, two white men, three black men, one black woman, and two mixed or biracial women. That was the first in US history. Testimony to the continuing impact of those attitudinal changes around race. Most significant, all 12 jurors belong to the working class. Their decision should hearten all of us in realizing what working people, despite centuries of ruling class efforts to use skin color to divide us can accomplish when acting together. It points the way forward. Since time immemorial, long before racial slavery, the police have existed to enforce class inequality, to serve and protect the interests of the ruling rich. Forging a genuinely inclusive anti-police brutality movement that treats each participant as an equal, regardless of skin color or any other identity is a possibility for the first time in the United States. That kind of movement is exactly what will be needed to end class inequality, to end, in other words, police brutality. There is no better example than what the Cubans did. A movement, in other words, to do something truly transformative, something, dare I say, actually revolutionary. Thanks, Mel, again, for inviting me to, uh, to write that. Thank you so much, I guess, for sharing that. Um, now, we, we, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Rosemary Mealy, who um, uh, was, is the author of Fidel and Malcolm X, Memories of a Meeting, um, who, and who was also an adjunct professor at CUNY City College of New York, Center for Worker Education, who became involved in the Black Panther Party after the assassination of uh, Chairman Fred Hampton and Deputy Mark Clark here in Chicago, where I am, um, and who also um, has lived in, in Cuba and collaborated on several projects in support of US political prisoners, including um, working with Asada Shakur, um, and also is an organizer um, in, in the international human rights and political prisoner movement. And it is my great, great honor to um, bring and welcome Dr. Rosemary Neely. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much. It's, that's a wonderful um, introduction. You must have gone to Google or something. <laughs> but anyway, I just want to first acknowledge that I'm speaking to everyone here from the um, free territories of the Seminole people of uh, South Florida. And um, I'm just honored to have been asked to uh, participate in this, uh, in this forum. I want to thank Andrew for inviting me and the Coalition Against um, Police Terror, uh, Stop Killer Cops, yes. Thank you so much for inviting me to um, participate in this forum tonight. I, I kind of um, looked at this topic and I decided that I wanted to share some insights um, in tribute, um, and I'm really going to focus on the globalization of the African American freedom struggle. And in that context, um, I want to lift up the names of some of our ancestors who were advocates in laying out our grievances on a global scale of how our people have been victims of collective terror and racist violence in the United States. They are Sister Ida B. Wells, W.E.B. Du Bois, attorneys Earl Dickerson and William Ming, Herbert Apsecker, William Patterson, Paul Robeson, and George Floyd. Each of these individuals, along with organizations such as the National Negro Convention, the National Council of Negro Women, the Communist Party USA, and today, the Black Lives Matter movement. They're all in profound ways have contributed to internationalizing our fight against racist violence and terror perpetuated against black people under the color of law. And they've been targeted, surveilled, brutalized, maimed, and killed by law enforcement officers with impunity. You know, during the early 1890s, a series of shocking lynchings brought unprecedented international attention to America's mob violence. 
And it was in 1894 that Ida B. Wells arrived in Liverpool, England to tell our story. She asserted that lynching was a racially motivated act of brutality designed to enforce white supremacy. Thus the transatlantic activism of this African-American female journalist an anti-lynching crusader had the impact of transforming the understanding of racial violence abroad. You know, but it also had the effect of making even white communities in this country increasingly reluctant to embrace lynching. So Ida's campaign against the lynching of black men and women generated international scrutiny. As British criticism of lynching mounted, Southern political leaders desperate to maintain positive relations with, and this sounds familiar, to maintain positive relations with potential foreign investors, they were forced to choose whether to publicly defend or to decry lynching. So Wells campaign had the impact of altering the framework of the public debate about lynching and the debates around the role of extra legal violence in US society. And as a result of Ida Wells' transatlantic activism, she contributed to redefining the narrative which brought unprecedented international attention to white mob violence against black people. But as we reflect on the history, British moral pressures and media attention did not end lynching nor violence perpetuated against our people. And so some 50 plus years later, the rise in racially motivated attacks and violence against black people would now take center stage in the international arena where our cause would be taken to the United Nations. So the charter of the United Nations is the founding document of the United Nations. It was signed on the 26th of June in 1945 in San Francisco. And at the conclusion of the United Nations Conference on International Organizations, the charter came into force in October of 1945. So the United Nations can take action on a wide variety of issues due to its unique international character and the powers that were vested in the charter, which is considered an international treaty. And as such, the UN Charter is an instrument of international law and UN member states are bound by it. So the UN Charter codifies the major principles of international relations from sovereignty equality of states, the prohibition of the use of force in international relations. So since the founding of the U of 1945, the mission and work of the organization has been, to, has been guided by the purposes and principles contained in its founding charter, which has been amended three times, one in 1963, 65, and again in 1973. So the International Court of Justice the principal judicial organ of the United Nations functions in accordance with the state of International Court of Justice, which is annexed to the UN Charter and it forms an integral part of it. So the UN, United Nations Charter was a framework for states. It was a promise to people. Article one lists among the major purposes that of achieving human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinctions to race, sex, language, or religious then you have Article 13, 55, 62, 68, and 73. They all framed, they're all framed as sacred trust in respect to all aspects of being protected against abuses and respect for human life. So almost immediately after the Charter came into force, NGOs, especially here in the United States, recognized how this international organization could be used to attack racism in the country. So in 1946, the first U.S. petition on human rights where black folks laid out their grievances to the commission was drafted at the National Negro Convention in Detroit, and the document was prepared by Herbert Apfecker. The petition did not generate any formal action, but what it did, it attract international attention. Then in 1947, W.B. Du Bois, along with famed civil rights attorney Earl Dickerson's and William Ming, they drafted a petition on behalf of the NAACP to the UN Human Rights Commission. The document was titled An Appeal to the World, in which the NAACP asked the UN to redress human rights violations, which the United States committed against its African-American citizens. And W.B. Du Bois presented the petition. Then in 1951, 
the Civil Rights Congress affiliated with the Communist Party engaged in a campaign to hold the United States accountable for genocide against African Americans. And they charged that under the legal rubric laid out by the United Nations, the United States, which failed to enforce its own constitution, must be punished, quote, under international law for its genocide, its genocide against African Americans. So on December 17, 1951, Paul Robeson and William Patterson submitted a petition from the Civil Rights Congress and it was titled, We Charge Genocide, the Crime of Government Against the Negro People. The petition was signed by almost 100 US intellectuals and activists and Paul Robeson led the delegation to present the document at the UN headquarters while CRC Secretary Patterson delivered, delivered it to a UN meeting in Paris. The document specifically stated, quote, once the classic method of lynching was the rope, now it is the policeman's bullet. To many an American, the police are the government, certainly its most visible representative. So we submit that the evidence suggests that the killing of Negroes has become po police policy in the United States. So by bringing the We Charge Genocide claim before the UN, it further internationalized the struggle of Black folks. It is recorded that, uh, as the document stated, that it was, it was, it, it was all these condemnations that was laid out, the terrible injustices that constituted a daily and ever increasing violations of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. So it is sometimes incorrectly thought that genocide means the complete and definitive destruction of a race of people. But the Genocide Convention, however, however adopted, by the General Assembly of the United Nations on December 9, 1948, defines genocide as, quote, any killing on the basis of race or in its specific words as, quote, killing members of the group. Any intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, racial, ethnic, or religious group is genocide, according to the convention. Thus, the convention states, causing seriously bodily or mental harm to members of the group is genocide as well as as well as killing members of the group and then in 1964 and it's mentioned here malcolm x attended the second meeting of the organization of african unity the oau there he presented a petition asking quote in the interest of world peace we beseech the heads of the independent african states to recommend an immediate investigation into our problems by the united nations commission on human rights, end of quote. According to United Nations procedure, a nation can request the human rights intervention of another country on behalf of people whose rights have been violated. So the African heads of state discussed the proposition at the OAU summit, but unfortunately they failed to bring the case before the United Nations, based in part by pressures by who none other than the United States State Department. So since 1964, there have been other organizations who have maintained the continuum in exposing loudly and condemning the rise in racially inspired human rights violation. In June of 2020, one month after George Floyd was murdered, the UN Human Rights Council held what was announced as an urgent debate on currently racially inspired human rights violations, systemic racism, police brutality, and violence against peaceful protests in the United States. And at that gathering, speakers urged the council to establish an international commission of inquiry to investigate systemic racism in law enforcement in the United States. The Africa group placed this important topic on the agenda. There were many, there were many endorsements, there were speakers. Some endorsed the idea of creating an independent commission of inquiry, urging the council to take action and, be, and not become a passive observer. And of course, there, the United States intervened again. So on April the 22nd of this year, the International Commission of Inquiry on Systemic Racist Police Violence Against People of African Descent in the United States officially released its, its report. And our brother Horace Campbell, is going, who was a rapporteur uh, in, with that commission, is going to talk about the context of, of that commission and what what was established. And as I said, er, said earlier, the commission was established in the wake of the public execution of George Floyd. 
So what we have now, where do we go from here? Including in the findings, recommendations, and analysis, which are all based on live hearings and information on over 44 cases of police maiming and killing direct, directed at Black people in the United States. It's a, it's a full 188-page report, and it's available for download as a PDF. And in the chat, we will, um, we will state where, how you can get that document. It's very, very important. The commission found that neither domestic law nor police practices comply with the obligations of the United States under international human rights law and the standards that govern the use of force. The United States is woefully inadequate in protecting people of African descent from police violence. The United States does not have a, le a national legal framework for governing the use of force. Moreover, the United States Supreme Court has set few limits on the use of force by law enforcement officials and the limits that have been set, they don't meet international standards. And clearly the United States Congress has not filled the gap. So the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination prohibits practices that have a discriminatory purpose or effect. US jurisprudence only prohibits policies that have a discriminatory purpose or intent. So the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has called on the United States to review the legal definition of racial discrimination and pro prohibit it in all forms, effect as well as purpose. This information is included in the report. Now, one of the things that we've been looking at, we have all this information. We have the evidence adduced at the hearings regarding the widespread and systemic killings and maining of unarmed Black people who pose no threat of death or serious bodily harm to police or others. And based on this systemic racism, the Commission finds what we call a prima facie case, that crimes against humanity, crimes against humanity have been committed. Now, on this basis, the Commissioners recommend that these crimes be investigated and that they be prosecuted as allowed by international law. So these human rights abuses continue to escalate. There's an organization called the Spirit of Mandela, the Spirit of Mandela Movement. The Spirit of Mandela Movement recognizes the urgency of taking the case of, quote, we the people to an international level. So a virtual tribunal is being organized from October 22nd to the 24th. This is another call to action. Like before, the first we charged genocide. Using the documents, such as those from the International Commission of Inquiry on Systemic Racist Police Violence of People of African Descent in the United States, and also how to applicably apply the instruments of international law. So that's how we would view taking action right now. We know who has historically internationalized our struggle and we're in a very good position now with support of African nations. And our brother Horace Campbell will now, um, he'll take it up from there. Thank you so much for allowing me to share these few words. Yes, uh, I really wanna uh, thank Rosemary uh, for her comments <laughs> and helping to introduce Horace. Uh, I just want to take the opportunity to uh, express my uh, pleasure and uh, honor in being able to collaborate with Rosemary around Cuban solidarity work uh, through our Minnesota Cuba Committee and make a plug for her great book, again, on the meeting between Fidel Castro and Malcolm X. Uh, I had a chance to go back and look at it recently. It was a very, very insightful uh, report by a Black Cuban reporter who was a part of the delegation uh, with Fidel Castro uh, at the Hotel Teresa in 1906. And his comments uh, about Malcolm are really, really um, in insightful. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Rosemary. Yes, it's a real honor to introduce our next speaker, uh, Horace Campbell, who I regard not only as a comrade, but also as a colleague. Uh, Horace is professor of uh, political science and African American African studies at Syracuse University. We go way back, <laughs> at least four or five decades. And so we've been through a lot, seen a lot. And so it's a real honor to, to be uh, with him. And uh, Rosemary has set up uh, and talked about the commission 
the inquiry. It's a 200 page report. Uh, there's a link on the screen and I encourage people to look at it. Uh, the commission was sponsored by the National Conference of uh, Black Lawyers, the International Association of uh, Democratic Lawyers and the National International Lawyers uh, Guild. So without further ado, uh, welcome Horace. Uh, good evening, comrades. Um, I, I really want to thank um, the organizers of this um, Stop Police Killing to invite um, me to participate. As August said, um, um, about a month ago, I sent the report to August and I asked him that he should do what he can to popularize and publicize this report. I, I want to thank my sister, Rosemary, who has been in trenches. She's laid out um, the main findings of the report. And I think what I will do is to give some more work of the context of what we're doing. I also want to thank uh, Mel for his exposition about what has gone on in Minneapolis. Um, the only thing that saddened me about what Mel said is um, what has happened to Chris, because I remember coming there in the 90s, and I think um, um, you remember um, about us working with Chris and with the present attorney general and when we brought Yusequian and the Caribbean struggles there. So I think we have to, as we go along, make, ensure that we do not forget our brothers and sisters along the way. I, I'm also very happy to be on this panel with Don Rojas. Um, in fact, I have not seen Don Rojas for a while and I, 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 I know Don has not been in the best of health. And so I was very worried so to have him Tonight, um, speaking was very, very important. I, I, I want to heal up um, and Don, and although Don did not say it, Don worked for the University of the West Indies, and one of the 12 international commissioners is Professor Beckles, who um, himself was not able to be at the hearing because when he was um, to oversee the hearing, um, on the 6th, it was an emergency, as there always are in the Caribbean at the moment. So I, I, I must say that this is a context. Today, um, we rolled out the Commission of Inquiry hearings in West Africa. Today, we had a press conference in Nigeria with the president of the Bar Association in Nigeria and two commissioners, Angelique Pierce from New York, and um, uh, I'm sorry, one family spoke um, Angelique Pierce from New York and a commissioner from Jamaica, Bert Samuels spoke and he spoke eloquently about the um, importance of this commission for the Caribbean and for Caribbean peoples. Um, last week, um, Tuesday, we rolled out the commission in South Africa before South African journalists and last week, um, Thursday, we rolled out with Kenya and the work in Africa is being spearheaded by the former Chief Justice of Kenya, um, Dr. Willy Mutunga. And the work is to get Kenya, which is a member of the Security Council of the United Nations to support the African Union in bringing the findings of the commission for the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. So this is what is going on. So my participation in this discussion on stop um, killer cops is part of the work of how to popularize and internationalize the report. And I want to thank Rosemary because what Rosemary has shown is that if you take the time to read the report, understand the report, you will see the significance of this report at four levels. The first level is the importance of this report to give voice to the families of those people who have been killed. The second level is in order to force the legislative agenda in the United States of America. The fourth, the third level is the internationalization of the crimes against um, people 
in the United States of America so that the entire world understand systemic racist police violence against people of African descent. And the fourth level is to engage the African Union to be at the forefront of taking this matter before the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. So this work is, as, as Rosemary, and I, I really want to stress the eloquence of what Rosemary said, because this work is a continuation of the work of William Patterson and Paul Robeson in their We Charge Genocide. And that um, document inspired those of us who worked on the report. And there were 12 commissioners, and I think we should give them their due by naming them. The commissioners who oversaw this report were Professor Hilary Beckles of Barbados, Professor Nekofor um, Bhagwat of India, um, Mr. Zolani Bokwani of South Africa, is the president of the Bar Association of South Africa, Muriel Fanon Mendes of France, who is the daughter of Franz Fanon, um, Dr. Um, Fournier Fasio of Costa Rica, Judge Peter Herbert of the United Kingdom, Hina Jelani of Pakistan, who is president of the International Organization of Tor Against Torture, Professor Rashid Manju of South Africa, Professor Osmani Nikur of Japan, Sir Claire Roberts of um, Antigua and Barbuda, Bert Samuels of Jamaica, of Jamaica and Hannibal Uwafo of Nigeria. These were the commissioners who oversaw the commission of inquiry. I was one of the rapporteurs who oversaw the hearings and the four rapporteurs were um, myself, Marjorie Khan, Rhea Julian and Professor um, um, Priscilla Oten. So the, this, this work that was done by the commissioners, the findings of the commission report are what Rosemary spoke about and we call on you to help to internationalize. Now, how did this commission came, come about? The families of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Michael Brown, Philando Castile joined with 600 human rights group and petitioned the United Nations Human Rights Council to appoint a UN Commission of Inquiry to investigate systemic racist police violence and attendant human rights violations against people of African descent in the United States. After succumbing to enormous pressure by the United States and its allies, the Human Rights Council instead directed the Office of the High Commissioner to prepare a report on systemic violence and violations of international human rights by police against the people of African descent in the United States. Now, this um, deferral of the Human Rights Council came from the pressure of the United States of America to the United Nations to say, you should not investigate the United States, you should make it generic. But they, um, the families pressured and so under the pressure of the families, the, um, the, the, the National Conference of Black Lawyers, the International um, Association of Democratic Lawyers, and the National Lawyers Guild convened this Commission of Inquiry. And so the findings of the Commission of Inquiry, after sitting for nearly three weeks, um, the findings on the recommendations of the inquiry are most noteworthy. That the, the, the First is what Rosemary said already, the crimes against humanity committed in the United States of America. I want to just mention two of the findings that we want to stress. First, that the Human Rights Council of the United Nations set up an independent commission of inquiry to determine whether the level of police violence against people of African descent in the United States constitute a gross violation of human rights and whether crimes on international law have been and continue to be committed. In other words, that's the first thing we want. Second, to appoint an independent expert on systemic racist violence in the United States of America. So this uh, the, uh, the report is um, 
280 pages long. I'm only drawing to your attention two of the most important recommendations to the Human Rights Council. In the discussion, I can answer questions about um, how this work will go forward. We anticipate that before the Human Rights Council meets in Geneva in June, we will roll out this commission in the United Kingdom and in Geneva and in New York before the General Assembly, we will roll this out. As Rosemary said, there's going to be an international tribunal in October. Similarly, the African Bar Association will have a meeting in October. So the report is quite extensive in terms of its drawing from the crimes against the African people in the United States of America. The other point which is noteworthy is that the commission calls for the demilitarization of law enforcement throughout the United States. And because if you look at section three of the report, you will see how the historic violence against African-Americans is embedded in systemic racism in the United States of America. And we draw attention to the 1033 program of the National Defense Authorization Act where the military transfer weapons to the police departments in the United States of America. The other part which I want to bring to the attention of um, Don Rojas is the question of reparative justice. That's on the part of the legislative agenda, the um, report is calling for the United States government and its um, Congress to pass the George Floyd Policing Act also that they should embrace the Caribbean Reparations Commission proposal about people of African descent and why the question of racism um, constitutes a crime against humanity. I want to say specifically, the commissioners urge the United States to consider seriously applying analogous elements contained in the Caribbean community 10-point action plan on reparations, which includes a formal apology, health initiatives, educational opportunities, an African knowledge program, psychological rehabilitation, technological transfer, and financial, um, and financial support. So the, 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 um, the, the end of this is not something I can go into great detail. I can only share with you and invite you to read the report digest the elements of this that brings out the point of how the United States violates international law. The United States of America goes before the international community to talk about human rights. But if you look at the 12 main conventions on human rights, the United States has signed only three, signed and ratified three. It has signed and not ratified three others. And conventions on torture, on immigrants, on children, they have not signed um, these conventions. So when it comes to our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, in Cuba, in Venezuela, this is actually um, a vehicle to ensure that we bring attention to the crimes against humanity that's been committed against Africans in the United States of America. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, I am just uh, I, I, thank thank you so much. I there's so much that you said, um, and Aza um, in the chat has been sharing links to to the reports that have been mentioned. So please do click those links um, um, and and study the reports that have been shared. Um, there is so much here to kind of dive into. We haven't yet been receiving any questions, but I do have some questions. But before we go to questions, we have one more speaker. And um, Gerald, Elijah, um, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and to turn on your video. Um, so I just sent you the signal there. Um, and while we wait for that to happen, I'll, I'll introduce who he is. So Gerald Reed, um, is um, a survivor of Chicago police torture. Um, and Gerald was uh, uh, in, uh, incarcerated for over 31 years 
and was just released a month ago. So let's be patient as we navigate technology. There have been extraordinary advances in you know, the internet and, and cell phone usage and all of that. So while Ger Gerald is figuring that out, um, but I want to share a little bit about the significance of, of the fact that he has been freed um, now uh, for, um, uh, he's been out for 30 days. Um, Gerald was um, part of the now well-known existence of torture um, uh, used as a standard practice in Chicago policing. Um, he was tortured into giving a false confession um, to double murder. Um, the police uh, tortured him so severely that they broke a metal rod in his leg um, and which left him um, really unable to walk. And for, the for 26 years while incarcerated, um, they refused, the, the uh, Department of Corrections refused to operate um, and so he was left in excruciating pain on top of having already been tortured, was then left to live in excruciating pain for two decades while fighting um, to overturn his case. Um, now, I mentioned a little bit about John Burge, the former police commander here in Chicago um, and the reparations ordinance, but how that came about was through multiple decades, 38 years to be exact, of survivors demanding that their stories be heard and acknowledged. Um, and after report after report um, from uh, family members, um, from attorneys, uh, um, um, and then corroborations began to uh, come forward from doctors who confirmed um, what people experienced. Um, and then inside whistleblowers came forward, we began to see in the early 80s um, some, uh, some movements on acknowledging that torture was in, in fact happening and it was, it, it was a routine part of CPD operating. Um, and then uh, story after story began to happen as journalists, investigative journalists, usually radical independent journalists, um, began uh, connecting the dots. And then in, in, in the 90s, um, a group of survivors who were, on, who were sentenced to execution, who were on death row, formed a study group and discovered through their studying together that they had all been tortured. And much like rape survivors and survivors of sexual assault, there is extreme shame. And so there also was in, in extreme shame, almost identical, um, uh, that survivors went through. And so people didn't talk about being tortured. Um, there was a lot of shame in, in saying that I was tortured into um, a false confession. Um, and so there are some survivors who, who had their rappies, their, you know, the, the, their cellmates, whom they never talked about torture until they were on the outside. And so these defendants who were on, uh, or, or these people who were on, the, on death row, then discovered that they all had been tortured and had been tortured by similar cops, um, formed the death row 10 and began working with organizers on the outside um, to get the death penalty um, abolished. And that was successful. Um, um, and in uh, 2004, I believe it was, um, uh, the Illinois governor put a moratorium on executions and which was then in, uh, instituted um, into permanency uh, by the Illinois state legislature who, um, who abolished, um, uh, um, abolished um, executions completely. Um, and, and like uh, 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 Dr. Rosemary um, talked about with the United Nations, um, there were petitions to the United Nations. It was uh, an, a, a group of organizers called Black People Against Torture who wrote the very first reports, brought it to the United Nations Committee Against Torture and said that torture is happening here um, in, in the city of Chicago, and there are over 200 people, primarily black boys um, and men who have been tortured into false confessions. And that began to elicit international coverage and international pressure, which then was felt in the city of Chicago. Burge was finally brought up on charges. Uh, however, the state, as they do, um, uh, delayed every step of the way. 
Um, and it was the month after the statute of limitations on torture had expired that they brought forth federal charges. And because that it has expired, the only thing that was left over um, was uh, perjury and obstruction of justice. So he was found guilty of those um, and, and was charged with um, four years in prison. He was then released early on, on Valentine's Day. Um, and um, however, the, the torture continues and there are people who are still incarcerated. Um, um, and Gerald Reed is, is an example of the fights um, um, that it has taken to, to, to get people free. Um, and Gerald, um, I'm still hoping that you can figure out how to unmute and, and come on camera. Um, but I'm, if, if you're not able to, I'm just gonna be your voice <laughs> uh, um, and, and explain that um, uh, some of how, you know, we, we're talking about cops who kill um, uh, and, and the name of the coalition is centering around cops who kill, but we know that it, it is the, the system as a whole. Um, and and uh, the, the murder of, 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 of people by police is, is the most atrocious because it is the most final. But there are so many levels of violence that lead up to that, um, that, that are a part of, of the routine um, uh, manner of uh, order of policing. And that includes torture. And so what happened with Gerald was that um, because of the movement here in Chicago around exposing torture, um, we were able to create a torture inquiry relief commission that is a that is only exists here in Chicago um, but is able to then um, hear cases from people who have been tortured and then determine whether there is credible evidence so that that can be brought back to a judge and people can get evidentiary hearings. The goal of that is to release people faster because if their evidence is found to be credible, then their case can be thrown out and they can be freed. That is what happened with Gerald. After 30 years, he was granted um, um, an evidentiary hearing. In that hearing, his case was found to, to have enough evidence of torture that his conviction was tossed out. That judge, Judge Gaynor, ruled on that December 18th, 2018, and was set to retire December 31st. That case was then moved over to a, another judge who was supposed to set bond and refused to set bond for a whole year. And then on February 14th, on Valentine's Day, 2019, he said he was throwing out Gaynor's ruling and sent Gerald back to serve out his life sentence which is an illegal technical, technically, right? It's an illegal move. A co-equal judge does not have the right to do that, but he's a judge and he knows that the only way to appeal that or the normal way to appeal that is going through the appellate court, which takes five to seven years and COVID hit. And so what we did instead was we decided to petition the governor and petition the governor for immediate um, clemency. Um, and that was successful. So we petitioned, we organized for a year, we had actions, we had marches, we had uh, telephone drives, um, email letter writing campaigns. And on April 1st, um, uh, Governor um, Pritzker commuted Gerald's sentence and he was able to walk free. And so he is free now. So August, I see you. Yeah. I no, this is very rich, uh, Aislinn, uh, the report. And uh, again, sorry, we can't hear from Gerald. But I was just curious, a question for Horace. Uh, does, the, does the inquiry, does the Commission of Inquiry know about the Chicago torture uh, oh, the, details? The, the, there, was, there was an expert witness about, that, that's all in the report. OK, OK, good. Just there, wanted to make there, sure. there was an expert witness on torture from Chicago. OK. And so what the next steps are with Gerald is um, that, you know, his case now, the Illinois Supreme Court ruled a week ago um, that what Judge Henley did was in fact illegal. And so they tossed out his ruling, which was great. But the state still can decide to uh, create a new trial. And so that's what we're waiting on. So there is the potential, and if the state's, uh, the special prosecutor who has been appointed 
um, uh, um, is allowed to go forward, he, he will prosecute, he will try to reincarcerate Gerald. Um, and so while we have had some wins in Chicago in terms of exposing the fact that torture is institutional um, and there has been the firing and the incarceration of one cop, the system, the entire system that is complicit remains unchanged. And so we are seeing coordinated and intentional attacks targeting torture survivors, trying to reincarcerate people um, and trying to roll back the wins that we have. And so um, unfortunately, Gerald's not here to speak for himself, but um, he is free now and we are determined to keep him free. So I want to thank you all. Go ahead, August. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying, if anybody else has questions of uh, right. Aislinn, uh, please jump in. No, I, I, okay, this is Rosemary. See, what, what that shows is the um, ineptness of the U.S. legal system. And, uh, and, and so it, it, it also, that, that's the argument that uh, the United States, each state uses the argument that we already have state laws that supersede uh, well, we have federal laws that supersede any kind of any other laws, despite the fact that many of these treaties, with the exception of many of them, the U.S. has signed in, on to them, but yet it does not recognize them. And so I think there's Gerald. Yeah, there he is. No. Right? No, it's somebody else. It said Gerald Reed. Okay. Um, so that, that's, that's the struggle that we have, but, but it's pre precedence has been set, you know, and we can move forward. And I think that we're in a very important period right now. And, and we need to, uh, like he said, it's, a, it's about education and the fact that African nations are pushing forward this, um, this, this, you know, the findings of the commission, that is great. We need to have that same kind of movement in this country. And, and so I think that it's, you know, during this period of COVID, we should try to make sure that as many people as possible hear about this, um, the, the findings of the commission and also again um, participate in the tribunal. I think that's that's going to be really important because it's really about educating the people in this country that the law. You know, I had a law professor I'll never forget, and and I raised him. His name was Haywood Burns, and one of the things that he always taught us, he said, never forget that race rules the law. You know, and 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 that's so and that's so true, and we're seeing that it's 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 replicated century after century, and and we have to. We have to use these forms to to expose it and to push forward and to use the instruments of international law. We, we can, oh, sometimes we may not be able to bring them into domestic litigation, but um, we can we can use the frameworks. You see, in housing, education, education is a human right. You know, but that's not put forth like that uh, across this country. We have to integrate the international concepts of what is human what are human rights into every facet of the society. And this becomes a tool for educating our communities, for educating our people. And, 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 I, and I'm, I'm feeling very, um, I feel very positive about this. So the struggle continues while at the same, it's, it's like, it's incredible. I mean, I think that the work of com the commission is, is, it's just so important and the results are just great. And I, I would really encourage people to go back and read the, um, the Patterson, um, Paul Robeson, we charge genocide because that, that's the foundation. And we have, enough, we have enough documented evidence to show that we can use some of these instruments in, in the international forums. Uh, August, can I, can I chime in? Please. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I just want to commend Sister Rosemary uh, on her presentation. It was beautifully contextualized and historicized. Uh, I hope you would consider publishing it somewhere or sharing, sharing it with us, but it was, it was beautifully done. Uh, I wanna uh, give a big shout out to my comrade uh, Horace, uh, who I have not seen in, 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 a, in a few years, in a couple of minutes. Uh, and thanks for expressing your concern about my health, my brother. Uh, I am, I'm still fighting. I'm fighting the good fight, you know, taking it one day, one day at a time, but uh, trying to stay as involved in, uh, in the movement as uh, my energy would allow me to. 
Um, but uh, Harris, thanks also for for really uh, summarizing the the report of the International Commission's findings um, and uh, for lifting up the um, the importance uh, of the ten point plan that has been outlined by the CARICOM Reparations Commission. I'm happy to see that uh, the plan has made its made its way into the uh, into the commission's report. Um, I'd also like to um, to uh, to suggest, Harris, that as the commission moves forward with its work, you should also keep an eye on what's been happening uh, with the reparations movement here in the United States. It has literally exploded uh, since um, last uh, spring. Uh, of course, it uh, has also been influenced by the mass protests that have been taking place in the streets of uh, U.S. cities and towns um, last year. Uh, that, uh, that force, that tremendous galvanizing force and energy that came out of those street protests uh, have, been, uh, have, have informed um, the way uh, a whole lot of folks view uh, the contemporary reality. It has changed the lens within which uh, issues of uh, racial equity, issues of historical justice, reparatory justice, etc., cetera, uh, have to be viewed. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, movement here in the U.S. is taking place both at the, as you probably know, both at the national level with the uh, advocacy around uh, H.R. 40, the bill that is in Congress at the moment, making its way through Congress has, has reached a point uh, where no other uh, reparations type legislation has, has reached in the entire history of the US Congress. So that is something to be, uh, to be looked at as a, as, as, a, as a major advance. There is a possibility that uh, uh, Congress will actually have a House vote on, uh, on HR 40, which is being led by Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. She's the main champion of that legislation, but it has been endorsed and supported by over 300 civil rights and human rights organizations and grassroots organizations across the country. There is a, um, uh, a mass uh, campaign called We Can't Wait. Under, it's under, under the banner of We Can't Wait that uh, uh, activists, reparations activists, as well as social justice and racial justice activists all across the country have uh, have been supporting. Uh, uh, so this uh, reparations has been exploding. I mean, you take a look uh, also at the state level. Uh, the state of California has established a reparations task force. Uh, the governor of California has appointed um, uh, a commission uh, to uh, to begin their work uh, in the state of California, the largest, uh, most populous state in the United States. Uh, uh, you have um, the city of San Francisco itself uh, as one of the largest cities in the U.S. Has, has also established its own reparations commission. You see the similar energy cropping up at the municipal levels all over the U.S., places like Evanston, Illinois, uh, Asheville, North Carolina, uh, Amherst, Massachusetts, um, uh, up in, New in, in Rhode Island, I mean, play all over the place. And and, and with student activism, particularly black student activism uh, on, on college campuses on the rise, uh, we are finding too that uh, students are taking it on their own to establish local reparations groups to demand, to demand from their institutions, from their universities, many of whom had been actively involved in the African slave trade. Uh, George Washington University uh, is a, a prime example but also several of the uh, um, Ivy League schools uh, have had a long and sordid history with African enslavement in this country. So all of this is now uh, bubbling up from the bottom and, um, and forcing itself onto the public uh, discourse uh, and, uh, and also onto the political agenda. So um, I would suggest that, you know, uh, uh, the links between, in fact, the links between uh, the CARICOM Reparations Commission and the reparations movement in the U.S. is very strong. 
Um, uh, there is a regular communication going on between, uh, between the commissions in both places. And uh, uh, you're gonna see in, in the coming months, I think some really major global reparations initiatives emerging. Um, that uh, that will, will will reinforce uh, the the um, not the demands but the, certainly the recommendation that your commission uh, your commission's report has put up. So anyway, good to see you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Before we close, I just want to ask each of our panelists um, and and invite in the co-chair also to answer if you could um, uh, answer in, in about a minute. Um, what, what, are, uh, what, is, what is a concern or a criticism you have um, of the current movement and the current manifestation of struggle uh, that we are witnessing? Um, and what is one thing uh, that, that you see as a growth um, or as a, um, a, a promising uh, step forward. Well, I I would like to just respond to some of that because um, it's it's a constant question. I'm 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 very during this period of COVID and the pandemic, and um, I've I've just been so encouraged by folk going out into the streets anyway using the technology and creative ways, reaching people. I mean, I know that I've been in Zooms and, and, and a lot of these platforms where we may would have had a community meeting with five people. And then we look and see 60 people staying on, getting the information and then using the information. So I'm encouraged by that. I'm very encouraged by that, that despite the fact that we're up against a dreadful, a challenging situation. We're still, we're still doing it. We're still mobilizing people. We're still organizing. So that's very positive. I think my concern is that how do we um, use this energy right now that we have, that we see to um, expand our movement by incorporating the domestic issues with the international issues. I think that's because we, we're in a global world and we, we see attacks coming. For example, right now, there is a, a, a blockade against Cuba where it's just amazing that people are not able to talk. We're not able to have Zoom contacts with people. So the foreign policy of this country needs to be challenged, particularly on with, uh, with our neighbor 90 miles away. So that, that's a concern that I have. Um, I think that there are, of course, there are criticisms about accountability in terms of, I think August, the brother um, Mel mentioned, you know, how folks step into situations from the outside, assuming that people in their own towns can't handle issues and they go away um, with big, big bucks, you know, and no accountability. I think we have to start calling people on that that's that's a real important piece that we have to be doing this period we have to be critical of folk who are using our the blood of our of our brothers and sisters to to capitalize off of that i think that that's a concern that i have within within this some of the current stuff that's going on so it's it's those two things i think on the woman question that we still need to look at the impact that this pandemic has had on black women in particular, you know, and how we need to, to be raising each other up about that and to incorporate that into the whole question of black women and trans folk into our mobilization and, and, and seeing the importance of that. I'm encouraged, finally, I'm encouraged by the response that I've seen uh, against uh, the, the genocide that Israel is committing against our Palestinian brothers and sisters. And, and, and the broadness of that. So, so those are some of the things that I think are positive that's going on, despite the ugliness and despite the alienation, um, our political prisoners are languishing, um, Abu Jamal, uh, all, 
and, and so we have to bring that whole issue of of our political prisoners into this and, and, and into this uh, narrative. So on that, I those are just issues that I see. On one level, we're working on them. On other levels, we have to be conscious. On other levels, we can't. We can, we have to call. We have to, we're asking the police to be accountable, but we also have to be. We we have to make our leadership that has emerged accountable as well. Thank you so much for those words. You want to invite other panelists to answer the questions. And and co chair, if you have some thoughts, I could. Okay, I would want to um, underline a few points about um, the where where we are, and um, to say that we are in a qualitatively different place um, because of the crisis of global capitalism, and because of the fact that U.S. imperialism has been diminished and that the military management of the international system cannot continue as it has gone on before. And because the military management is under stress, it has created a crisis within the ruling class in the United States of America. And the old efforts to co-opt um, sections of the oppressed peoples um, is not working because the crisis is so profound that the white racists have, have, have come to the point where they are now about to break the, the military. Now, I, I, I think one of the most important difference between this International Commission of Inquiry on Systemic Racism, Police Violence Against People of African Descent in the United States, one of the most important difference between this report in 2021 and the William Patterson, Paul Robertson report is that in 1951, Africa was not independent, and Africans could not raise their voices in international fora, as they are doing now, as we've seen with the rollout in um, South Africa, in Kenya, and in West Africa. And the thing the United States hates more than anything else is to internationalize the question of systemic racism in the United States of America. Africa and the Caribbean, are members of the Security Council of the United Nations, and they will not go away. Um, the report will be rolled out in the Caribbean. We're looking for people who speak in Spanish to roll it out between Costa Rica, Venezuela, Cuba, and the Caribbean. Now, one of the things that has come out of Africa from the commissioners in Africa is that they're calling on the law students in African universities to take up this report as a project all across Africa and the law students will study this report and they will give a prize to one of them will come to a similar institution in the United States of America where they will work with professors here on issues of police violence. Um, and so these are ideas that are coming out, but the university as a whole in the United States of America is afraid of the ideas dealing with systemic racism and the crisis of capitalism. On the reparations question, I want to underline what um, Brother Don Rowe has said. Um, I just want to bring to the attention of Brother Don um, the divisive work that is being done by the Republican Party in the creation of an organization called ADUS, the African Descendants of, slave, of, of Slavery. And ADUS is a, a Republican tool to sow confusion among Africans. And I think this is where we need a progressive left to be more internationalist. In other words, there's an attempt to domesticate the questions of police violence against black people and to separate black people from the United States from black people from the Caribbean and black people from Africa. And I, I think that is what the right wing wants to do. And I, I would want that progressive people be aware of this and to be conscious and to follow the work of ADAS because in so many of our communities, people have been carried off by ADAS and even on Chicago radio stations, um, you can hear people talking about ADAS and the left has not involved themselves enough in the question of reparations 
fighting feeders. And so I, I would say the internationalization of the struggle against US imperialism. The last point I want to make is that in February of this year, the United States came out and talked about anti-Asian violence. And the anti-Asian violence is talk, talked about in February. And by May, the president signed the anti-Asian hate bill. Whether it was the dictator in the Philippines or the government of Malaysia, the governments in Asia brought it to the forefront that you cannot discriminate against people of Asia, of Haitian and Pacific Islanders in the United States of America. Our work in the commission and the work that we are continuing to do with Africans is to pressure the United States similarly, but the United States have no respect for Africans. That's why they will push through the Asian bill and the George Floyd bill has not gone forward. So our work is not only on the legislative front, it's on the popular front. But you should bear in mind that these efforts to separate Africans from African-Americans from African-Caribbean is what they will do to say African dictators cannot talk about racism, whereas Duterte in the Philippines can talk about racism and they can sign the sign and, and crime bill. Um, without um, this discussion. So these would be the last points I'd want to make. Thank you so much. Mel and Don. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to Mel. I, I have one or two quick points to make before we wrap up. I know we're running out of time, but let me let me defer to Mel. I noticed yeah. that, uh, that there were some questions I asked that we probably should answer. Uh, I think somebody asked uh, in how will we in uh, police violence and what can we do in the meantime? Uh, so I said, I think the, the second question, yeah, what can we do, can be done short of revolution? I think we're doing it, you know, that's why I talked earlier about um, organizing around the families because, you know, you, you can't deny the family's reality. Um, you know, um, I think somebody, he answered it short of revolution. I mean, ultimately, um, to uh, Horace's point, um, some things are making me nervous. Uh, he says, why can't police brutality be, be eradicated? Well, because the system of, of you know, capitalism requires it. Um, and so speaking of revolution, I mean, until you transform society, I mean, we can do some transitional things, which, which is what we're doing. But there's a lot of work. And some of we've gone backwards. You know, there's a lot of work to be in effect. Before I forget, now let me forget to mention, speaking of families, uh, August 28th, we're planning on going back to D.C. You know, that's the uh, anniversary of the march in Washington. So we're going to go back to D.C. And uh, we won't, you know, we, we we don't have shark in this time telling people to go to D.C. only without demand. We're going to D.C. with some demands that all, that, that they jail all the killer cops and reopen all the cases. So we'll have some solid demands. And I hope you all spread the word and we get folks up. So these movements, though, help people to begin to understand what's going on around them. That's the beauty of, of these fights, uh, the fight for universal uh, uh, health care. Uh, all these fights uh, open the door to young people understanding what they're up against in general, right? It's it's what, you know, this face is how most of us came to consciousness, right? You, by whatever it is you were dealing with personally, you know, if you're if you're black, racism kind of made you start thinking about stuff. Uh, police violence, or if you're a woman, sexism. If you're a black woman, racism and sexism. Uh, so a lot of things, these things can wake you up. Um, uh, to Horace's point, we've gone, we've gone kind of backwards. We've, we've taken some stuff, and it's kind of scary. To I get it, as old as person, it's it, the ADOS thing makes me nervous. Uh, the provincialism that I'm starting to see among black folks makes me. There's a young group of young people here who are all fired up, or even in this city. And they said they want to organize something around ADOS. And they mean well. But what it comes from is, I think when we were younger, because of the times, there was stuff you could learn. There was like books laying around even. You might, you might accidentally run into something to taught you something, right? Uh, or there were people talking about politics in the right way or in community, talking about international, you know? And so uh, not having those conversations, now we're doing this is good. There need to be more of them because um, they're just picking up what they hear and it sounds good, right? Because I get it, you know, black folks feel like, man, we're getting our butts kicked and you know, it's like everybody always coming in getting more than what we have. And so we've got to go back to teaching people internationalism, uh, Pan-Africanism and internationalism. We've gotten provincial 
uh, uh, in fact, you know, uh, this society does everything can to divide us, right? So we get divided on every, I mean, I'll never forget uh, a week or two into the fight for, for, for prosecution of Derek Chauvin and the Three Stooges, I call them. There was a, uh, there was a, twi- a tweet on Twitter by a black woman who said, oh, the black man ain't here for us. And it got like 30, 40,000 likes. Now in the midst of this big fight, we're all together. And it's like, whoa, you know, black women ain't gonna get free without the rest of the black folks. You know, black men ain't gonna talk to us black. This stuff has gotta stop. We gotta start looking at things as a, as a unit. We gotta start rebuild. Like I, I wrote that piece and I put it up here uh, because I forgot to mention one of the things that's happening here is that um, you know, the community violence thing has brought out some of the opportunists, you know what I'm saying, and folks talking about it, and they're throwing rocks at folks fighting police violence as if we're doing something wrong or immoral, and as if you can actually solve at least the police violence, you have a chance to make some real progress in that sense uh, against community violence. The only way that solves, it ultimately, is, as I pointed out, through a revolution, but short of that, you have to build community. They're running on talking and throwing rocks at people who, who are trying to, you know, get justice for for these other grieving moms are trying to pit one against them. It's insane. My point is though, the system is finding every way possible to to separate us, right? And we, it's really important that we begin to start talking with one voice. Blacks, you know, black men and black women, we got to come together. Uh, you know, we've got to stop. It's like every little thing that can divide uh, does it. It's it's crazy. I mean, you know. Um, we expect them to be to, to, to try to divide us, but we've got to find ways to combat that thing because I'm seeing it more than ever before. And, and the provincialism, you know, and the uh, the, the anti Pan Africanism, and anti and so it's hopeful to see black people supporting the, the Palestinians. And we got to have more of that. Maybe we got to have more teaching sessions about why it's important to do that, why we still should oppose, why Obama bombing Libya was a terrible thing. You know, because he could, you know, Bill Clinton couldn't bomb Libya, by the way. It <laughs> couldn't happen, right? And he sure as hell, nobody could have bombed Libya back in the 70s. It wouldn't have happened, right? The black people have been in the streets like you wouldn't believe in the 80s. So clearly something has changed, and we've got to figure out a way to get back that. And I think we've got to, we've seen hopeful signs with, especially white folks, beginning to see police violence is what it is. But I don't know what's going on in our community that we're taking this giant stuff back. But we, you know, we got to get back out here and and, and help folks begin to, to see that we're all part of a, a, a larger and global picture because this provincialism, I think, is is killing us. It's to our detriment. Yeah, uh, just a just. Oh. I'm sorry, August. Yeah, I was just going to follow up. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that um, I'm glad Horace raised the ADOS. Uh, phenomenon. I didn't know about it until right before the pandemic. I started seeing leaflets on campus at the University of Minnesota organizing meetings uh, for that uh, for that crowd. And yes, it's a provincialism, divide and rule. We know where it comes from. Uh, we know about the history of Africa and other third world countries and the use of provincialism to, to divide people from one another. Uh, yeah, just to uh, to mention to point out that this the situation in Minnesota we're going to have some opportunities to organize around. Remember, this trial is not over with. The judge uh, uh, Cahill has yet to sentence uh, Derek Chauvin. Uh, also, to this Dante Wright uh, case, uh, our Attorney General does not want this case. He was hoping he was hoping he wouldn't have to prosecute uh, in this Dante Wright uh, case. And so this will also be opportunities to help educate on what the police are. As, uh, as the prosecution made very clear uh, in its summation remarks, this was not an anti-police prosecution. This was a pro-police prosecution. Uh, the prosecution was designed to throw under the bus uh, so-called one bad apple uh, and make sure that we, didn't, we didn't interrogate the system, the barrel, the barrel itself. Uh, it was all about this one bad apple. And so we will have, because the police will behave as the police, this is what they have to do in order to enforce a uh, class rule, we will expect to see more cases. There will be opportunities to, uh, to, to organize. And I think we have potential that we've never had before. And I'm referring to the multiracial character of the protest. That's new. That has never happened before uh, in the United States. And so the potential, the potential is there. 
uh, whether or not we take advantage of it and understand uh, how to uh, make use of it and so on, that's another question, but the potential is certainly there. The international side of this, the commission, yeah, I think we wanna get this report, uh, Horace, into the hands of the Cubans. Right now, the United States is on a campaign uh, to go after the Cuban. There was an unfortunate police killing in Cuba last, last June of a black man. And the State Department has jumped all over that to try to impugn uh, the, Cuban, the Cuban revolution. And so getting this report into Cuban, the hands of Cubans, I know who would love to see this and to make use of it is a task uh, on our part. And if you have contacts, if I need, would like to have contacts in Cuba there between Rosemary and myself, we can put you in touch uh, with the relevant forces in Cuba and also in Venezuela. In fact, tomorrow, uh, Venezuela, I'm scheduled to be on a uh, George Floyd program uh, that's sponsored by the uh, Venezuelans, uh, Chucho uh, Chuco Garcia. And I'll bring this up uh, tomorrow with uh, Chucho about uh, uh, the inquiry. So yes, I think uh, uh, we have potential opportunities and so on. And it's important to take, take advantage of, the, of these opportunities to have the most kind of inclusive, inclusive kind of anti-police brutality uh, movement. Don, you want to close us out? Yeah, I just wanted to, I know we're running out of time. I just wanted to echo uh, what uh, uh, Harris and Augustine and uh, Mel said about ADOS. Uh, we, we, we are very familiar with uh, uh, their, their games. Uh, this is a very dangerous group, uh, not only doing the dirty work of, uh, of the Republican Party um, in an attempt to divide the uh, Black community, geographically and, and so on. Uh, it, it, they are agent provocateurs. I mean, they, they, they conduct themselves as such. Uh, they, um, they're on a mission to disrupt uh, any uh, progressive pan-Africanist narrative uh, that is emerging within the reparations movement. Uh, and so, uh, yes, let's keep a very close eye on them and, and let's find ways and means of isolating them and exposing them. It's a very dangerous phenomenon. Um, uh, thank God they have not yet infiltrated the uh, reparations movement in the Caribbean, uh, but they certainly are very active, especially on college campuses uh, in the United States. And I'm um, sorry, do, do you know if Cornel West has appeared on their platform and spoken yes, on their platform? Yes, yes, yes. Cornel West has appeared on their platform. Uh, and has said uh, positive things about them. I, I, I don't understand how he could justify that. Uh, but uh, they have tried to use that, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a vote of uh, confidence by a leading public intellectual. Um, hold on one second, let me see. Go ahead, Aris, this is my son, I got a, hello. I, 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 I think um, panelists here um, should bear in mind that book um, that Darity has published, um, which is being used as a Bible um, for these reparations. There are so many fronts that we have to fight on, but I think we have to pay attention to these different fronts so that um, when um, the university is a site for the struggle over the discourse on reparations, and systemic racism in the United States of America, and I'm, I'm, we've been we we've been trying to bring to our attention for our brothers and sisters in Africa and the Caribbean and in the Black community here um, that we should not be fighting over reparations and this division between Africans, Caribbeans, and African Americans because ultimately we have to join hands with the First Nation peoples because um, the genocide against the First Nation people is the ultimate crime that was committed in this society. Thank you all so much. Um, this has been just an extraordinarily um, stimulating for me. And, uh, and so I am, I'm just so great to have been able to share space with you all and to hear your thoughts, your work, um, your um, uh, uh, lessons that you're sharing with us and also the materials. There have been such uh, uh, an amazing amount of materials that you all have shared in the chat um, and that we can make available on the website when we um, publish 
um, uh, share this recording. So I wanna thank each and every one of you again. Um, and uh, the work continues. We are, we are um, indebted to um, the, the lessons of the past, um, uh, the fighting that has been a consistent reality of, of, of um, black struggle on the, in this hemisphere. Um, um, and uh, that legacy is being carried on today by the millions who took to the streets during the uprising last summer. Um, and, in, and, and it's continuing um, in, in the solidarity actions uh, uh, in defense of Palestinian liberation um, and the continued to demand the, the continued work to end police killings in this country um, and policing as we know it in this country um, to free all incarcerated peoples, especially political prisoners um, and tortured survivors. Um, and so I wanna thank you all again. Um, uh, this was uh, a, an extreme honor on my part. Please Thank give you. our best to Gerald, uh, to Gerald Reed, and uh, we wish the best for him. Yeah. I definitely will. Take care, everyone. All right. Take care. Thank you all. Have a good holiday. Okay, man. So, Mel, I'll talk to you later. I got to go to Lund's before it uh, closes. Okay. Uh, all, all right. right. So, you know, or, or okay, call man. me. Okay. Right. See you.